So let's just um, sit together in a guided sit for about 10 minutes. And then I'll introduce, um, sort of talk about my ideas that I hope will resonate with you about doing this practice in this time in porosity in particular and have a discussion. And we will always, <coughs> pardon me, always be done by seven. And if we're done earlier, we can be done earlier. Okay, so this is really meant to be something that will be, <coughs> excuse me, um, a practical support to people in their practice in this, in this difficult time. And I know that when I'm on Zoom a lot, my feeling at the end of the day is like, my whole being has moved to the front of my face. You know, that I just, <laughs> so I know that, that our tolerance for Zoom is, um, is really, it's, it's just, it's hard to Zoom a lot. So I promise this will never be more than an hour. If it's too much, feel free to, to leave, to not be here on, on video. Uh, just do what you have to do to take care of your, yourself. But let's see what we can accomplish. So find a, a comfortable enough position and take a moment just to appreciate all of us, all of us here together. And my favorite sitting instruction is sit with your full human dignity. Our practice is a wonderful and dignified thing. And as you come into the body, feeling welcomed, feeling at home, feeling that every part of you is welcome here right now. And you might greet the body in the way you'd greet an old friend. Appreciating the goodness of each of our intentions. and appreciating that you were able to follow through on your intention to be here tonight. That so often in our lives, we have a, an intention to do something and life gets in the way. So whenever we're really able to follow through with something that is really wholesome and beneficial, it's really worthwhile to let that sink in and really appreciate that. Really feel good about that. And if the kindest thing you can do for yourself right now is to be with the breath, then be with the breath. If the kindest thing you can do for yourself right now is to practice loving kindness, just letting those warm feelings of friendliness toward ourselves and others flourish, 
You could just rest in loving kindness. By any chance, you're not feeling kindly toward yourself or think that there's a practice that's kind. You can just say to yourself, as I often say to my worried little dog, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and just be with that.
we can just appreciate our coming together this evening to support each other in a time that is really challenging and is really characterized by the, really, well, it epitomizes the, the Buddhist teachings on uncertainty and impermanence. So coming together to support ourselves in each other. I'm not sure how sensitive the, the mic is. Um, you may hear my dog snoring, so. <laughs> Good sign. So I was reading um, an account of uh, the pandemic in the New Yorker and uh, the writer characterized uh, the experience as it's like we're all in a waiting room right now. And I thought that was such an interesting way of getting at that feeling that we have, that we've all been sort of waiting with this sense of um, great uncertainty about uh, how things are going to play out. And you know, for some people, there's a lot of anxiety, and it may be really acute anxiety, particularly if you have uh, a family member or a dear friend or someone you know who is actually sick right now. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around employment and income and the future, uh, and this, this sort of just a kind of low level sometimes of just uncertainty. Um, there's also um, boredom for many people that I've noticed the days sort of bleed into each other sometimes and it's the weekend and how is that different than the weekday for people who are not um, going to work. Um, and there's also grief and anger that uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the whole spectrum of being human um, shows up here. And sometimes when there are things that make us really happy, there's also this kind of um, feeling that, well, I'm not supposed to be happy. This is a time, I mean, I'm just feeling that, that that sort of incongruity maybe of the joy you're taking in, in the springtime. And, and kind of catching yourself and wondering if that's something, you know, should I be happy now when so many people are, you know, suffering in New York or in the, uh, you know, the packing plants in, in the Dakotas. So one of the things that has been useful to me as a purely practical matter, and I am a, a, a generally a really pragmatic person is to just sort of get clear about an intention and then get clear about a definite follow through. You know, my, my list for today, what I'm going to do today or what I, what I want to accomplish this week. And this isn't to put kind of a burden on, uh, on ourselves in the way that someone said, no, this is the time I should really get in shape or I should try to, um, you know, write that, write that novel that I was always going to start. I mean, it, it's not to, to put a, you know, sort of a, a big expectation. You should be something, doing something worthwhile with your time, but that it's really helpful to make an intention about what I'm, I'm going to do and then have a clear idea about how I can, can follow through with a commitment. 
Um, and it, you know, it often involves a lot of post-it notes or um, making notes, but, but I find that helpful. So I'm, I hope that what we can do is each week come up with some creative or concrete ways that we can strengthen um, one of the paramis in us. So the paramis, um, if you are not um, very familiar with them, they are called the 10 perfections of the heart. And um, the word parami means sort of to the farthest shore or the supreme achievement. So the paramis are, uh, param is carried to the furthest shore in Pali and parama is foremost in importance. So the paramis are 10 qualities or perfections of the heart and they are generosity, morality or integrity, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. And they're often taught in a way that it's a kind of developmental schema, although some of it may seem a little, a little arbitrary. And classically, the uh, teaching was that the Buddha in many previous lifetimes mastered all of these, these qualities. And some of you may know about something called the Jataka tales, and they were written long after the life of the Buddha. And they were folk tales and teaching tales in which the Buddha is you know, sometimes a tiger, sometimes other sorts of, of animals or persons in different circumstances. And the whole lifetime is to um, develop this quality, to perfect this, this quality. So, um, and you know, in, in Western philosophy, they're, they're very much like virtues. And virtues are thought, thought of as you know, strengths of character. So they're things that help us be more wonderfully human. They're, they're characteristics of um, sort of the excellences of human beings. And the first of these is generosity. And that probably makes a lot of sense in that, you know, when we, uh, when we see children, like what is the first thing that we treat, we sort of teach children to do? And it's share, you know, share your toy with someone else. Um, it, it's this, uh, in, in Asia, when uh, there are monks going on their rounds, Parents often stand and they hold a small child and they give the child a bit of rice or a bit of food to put in the monk's bowl. So this idea of sharing is one of the earliest things that we, we teach. And it's um, with you know, young kids, no, that's mine. That's mine. That belongs to me. And the practice, interestingly enough, is really a practice that is about learning to sort of let go of the self, literally of non-attachment, which of course is something that's really significant in our, our Buddhist practice about this idea about non-attachment. So giving is the very first of these. And the practice of generosity is really understood as an antidote to greed. And it is, um, the characteristic of it is relinquishing. We let go of something and it dissolves greed and it strengthens non-attachment. So it's the active practice of non-clinging in the most concrete sort of way. When we practice generosity, we're practicing non-clinging. And there's a material aspect to generosity. And we can think about, you know, supporting, um, a worthy cause financially, helping someone in need of material support, um, giving our possessions away for the joy it would bring another. And what's interesting about the classical teaching, the classical Buddhist teaching on generosity is that it is characterized by joy, 
before, during, and after. That when we are truly experiencing generosity, that we have joy in the anticipation of giving, joy while we are giving, and joy after we give. Now, this might not always be the case when we're actually giving. Sometimes we give grudgingly. Um, sometimes we give because we have to. But the idea, and I think this is, is such an interesting one, it is supposed to be when we are truly practicing generosity, a real source of joy and happiness. And you might just reflect in your own life when someone has given something to you or you have given something to someone else about the joy that you feel. And it can be I mean, a really um, uh, simple example. And this is you know, really so like when I um, make an effort to take my dog out and let her run, like and make it really fun for her. That act of generosity gives me a lot of joy. Um, and we can think about this in, in all sorts of ways that this appears in, in our own lives when we, we either do something with someone or we give something. There's also um, uh, an important non-material aspect of joy. And that is um, what the, the sort of internal work of joy. Um, and we can talk about uh, giving up, giving away our attachment to views, which may be a really challenging one. Giving up, giving away um, a preference. Or we might understand this as including others that we um, might not always want to include. A, a generosity of inviting someone into our circle. A generosity of extending friendship to someone or just even seeing and saying hello to someone. You know, um, there is nothing that is so precious as, as attention, of giving someone really kindly attention. And we can understand that as, as an act of generosity. And it does give us pleasure. I mean, that's the other thing. When we extend ourselves to someone else and we get that, that beautiful response and we really feel joy that we did that. Um, a non-material aspect of generosity is offering, uh, offering time. Um, and, um, you know, being there to listen to someone else can be an extremely generous act to really bring our whole selves into the room and listen to someone, to pay attention, um, to support that person. And um, letting others choose, that's um, an act of generosity, that it's not always um, the, way, the way I want it. Um, letting other people uh, you know, um, have their preferences. And all of these are, we sometimes don't think of them as generosity, but it is a kind of giving away and letting go. So this is the sort of, of internal work of, uh, of doing this. So we can think about how we might practice this during this time. How does generosity show up for us in a time in which we are, um, the forces around us really incline us to think about ourselves a lot. It's really easy to become um, very self-centered uh, in a time of isolation and fear. And the real antidote to that is to extend ourselves to others and extending ourselves to others in a time when we may be physically distanced is also um, makes it more complicated, makes it a challenge. Or the, the converse might be true, that if you are living in a situation with 
a number of other people living um, closely in a house or an apartment when you don't have the time to be uh, have as much privacy, have, have as much um, isolation. That also calls for skillful acts of generosity in living communally. Um, so we might think about how we could do this at this time. And I, I just remembered a story that I think is, is um, charming with the Buddha. One of the famous sayings of the Buddha was, if you understood as I did um, the benefits of being generosity, you would not have a meal without sharing it. Even if it were your, your last meal, even if it were your last mouthful of food, you would share it. And Kamala, Ma <laughs> Kamala Masters, my beloved teacher, tells a story about her teacher, um, Manindraji, who when he visited with her and he would, she would give him his, his food, after he ate, he would take a little bit, a few crumbs, and he put it down on the floor in the kitchen for the ants or the insects because he wanted to, to share his food. And um, the Buddha says also that he, he advised this the monks, if there's anything left in your bowl, rinse it out in, in a pond or a place where the animals that are living in that pond can consume the rest of the food. So there's this real idea about um, generosity, but also economy and thrift. And so very, very, the practice of, of sharing is a very beautiful practice. So what are some ways that we can practice now um, in, this, in this time? I've got a couple of suggestions and ideas, but would anyone like to share something right now? And you can either do it through the chat or just unmute yourself and chime in. Anything that anyone would like to suggest that they've been able to do? But one thing I know that, that many people have done who have been able to is to um, provide financial support for food shelves, for, you know, this may not be possible for many people now, especially the people who are um, really struggling with lack of income. But for people who have um, who have some uh, income that they could share as an act of generosity, you know, contributing to um, a food shelf, maybe doing something locally, something nationally, and something internationally of finding places to support that give you joy. That would be one thing that's, that's uh, possible. Um, uh, and Andrew says here, I'm able, so have been volunteering at Catholic charities who supply meals to the hungry, including my teenage daughter in this. That's very beautiful. Thank you, Andrew. So if you're able, to volunteer. That is a wonderful, wonderful way to practice generosity. Um, I've been um, taking books to my little free library and, and I really think about books that I've enjoyed. I think, well, I, will I read that again? And I think, well, I can always get another copy from the library, but this is a book I enjoyed and maybe someone else will enjoy it too. I've also given away almost all of the, the cookbooks that I've somehow accumulated since I am, as my, my friends know, a non-cook. I mean, I, the, the joke is in, in my house, uh, a hot meal is a piece of toast. So um, I have given away many, many cookbooks that I have acquired. Not all, because there are some that I, I think it's possible, it's possible that I might um, and there are many of the little free libraries now are little free pantries. So if you have some, um, you know, some extra non-perishable food, you could put that, you could find the little free pantry in your neighborhood. 
and make that part of your walk. And every time you go for a walk, is there something you can take and, um, and donate? Um, could you connect with someone who could use your, your, uh, your friendly support? Is there someone that um, you could just check in? And you know, this has been such a wonderful thing with, uh, we all now have an excuse to do this because of the virus. So people that you haven't talked to maybe in a long time of sending them a card, a note, um, however you wanna get in touch and just saying, you know, these are times when I just have a lot of time to think and I just wonder how you're doing and send you my, my very best wishes. That means so much to people. And it is, is such a, a great practice to, to offer support and um, you know, to make that sort of, of connection. And there may be people who could really use someone to just listen to them. And you know, attention is such a precious gift when we really offer our attention without an agenda, that is such um, a beautiful gift. And ah, Maria says, I read with my friend's eight-year-old daughter over Zoom twice a week. Oh, what a wonderful practice. What a great way to connect. Reading aloud, now reading aloud is, is just, um, Many of us listen to audiobooks, but reading aloud to uh, even our adult friends is sometimes a wonderful, wonderful um, gift, something that means something to you. You read aloud to them. And um, what else do I have here? Um, in your household, and I live in a household with um, two other adults and uh, two dogs, um, in your household, um, you could do someone else's chores and not make a big deal of it. That's, that's the hard part, but you know, you could, could just out of a sense of generosity, do someone else's chores in your household. Um, an act of generosity might be being more flexible about, um, your shared activities, um, you know. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, whether you're willing to play games with someone, um, you know, I'm not, uh, not much of a game player. Uh, I had a grandmother who loved to play Michigan rum and canasta, and for much of my childhood spent many, many evenings playing Michigan Rummy and Canasta. And to this day, a deck of cards is sort of like kryptonite to me. But it's possible that I would learn to play a card game and play with someone else. So, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that that we think, oh, I, don't, I don't do that. But, you know, maybe this is the time to think, well, maybe I could do it. You know, it's letting go of, uh, generously letting go of um, preferences. Oh, and John has something here. The tight feeling of uncertainty causes a stingy feeling. I've decided to start with something. I'm hoping it will be a habit. Yeah, that, that uncertainty causes us often to sort of withdraw. And, and stingy is a, is a good way. The Buddha actually uses the word about stinginess. How, how damaging stinginess is. And... Uh, Judy said, my four-year-old grandniece sent us pictures she had made. Now we're going to read a book to her via an app called Marco Polo. That sounds like fun. That sounds, sounds really, really good. Okay. And the other place to practice generosity is toward ourselves. And that may be the hardest of all. So in this, in this time, 
sort of self-critical tendencies and the self-critical voice may be really active. So how can we practice generosity toward ourselves in this time? Does anyone have, have an idea about what would be an act of generosity toward yourself? A loving kind, Miriam suggests a loving kindness practice regularly. So the other day when I was supposed to do um, the loving kindness practice um, and Gabe had showed me how to do this and I thought I'd left plenty of time to get on and, um, and I didn't. It started four minutes late and I am a very punctual person. And I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that I had to call Gabe. I was embarrassed that we started late. And I was so um, agitated that I, when I finally got on, I actually thought, I'm just going to pass out right here in the chair. You know, things got really white. And I said, all right, let's just sit for a minute. And, you know, I recovered and went, um, we did the loving kindness practice. And after I was done, you know, there was just all of this um, self castigation, right? As someone's saying here, Lee Tao is saying, stop blaming yourself for the mistakes in the past. I mean, I just, so what I said to myself was, okay, it wasn't perfect. Nothing's ever perfect, but it was really good enough. It was good enough. And you know, that's an act of generosity when we can make that the standard for ourselves. This is good enough. And not, this wasn't perfect, but it was really good enough. It was good enough. And saying sort of like, as I said in, in our meditation, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. That kind of um, reassurance that kind of um, kindliness toward ourselves, generosity. So there may be something where you are, um, you know, sort of not giving yourself the, the break that would be the generous thing to do. You know, you didn't get in your 10,000 steps today. You didn't, whatever it is that, um, you know, you sort of, uh, imported as a benchmark. So what do we have here? We have uh, being with feelings that come up. Um, uh, continuing mindfulness when I have to transition to another room or activity. Generosity myself is continuing. How many transitions or rooms can I flow to? That's so beautiful, John. Continuing mindfulness when I have to transition to another room or activity. And one of the things that has been helpful to me, because we all often, you know, lose our mindfulness, you know, you, and you think, kind of, where was I, or I wasn't mindful about that, or, um, you know, I often say to myself when I have uh, misplaced my keys, or done something, or done something, and I just say to myself, you know, so much for the mindfulness teacher, you know, so boy, so much for the mindfulness teacher, and Alexander says, forgiving yourself, and instead, having that forgiveness. But also I heard Joseph um, Goldstein say something really interesting once. And I think this particularly applies to um, meditation, but I've also found it useful in other circumstances. He said, when you regain your mindfulness, really pay attention to that moment. Pay attention to the kind of subtle um, pleasure of regaining mindfulness instead of, you know, this, this sort of the way we, we often kind of castigate ourselves about that. 
So it's really, okay, um, you know, oh, this is mindfulness, feeling that, that happiness that we've come back to, to mindfulness. And that's a, a really good practice. And it has to be a practice because our general wiring is to be really critical of ourselves. So in this week of practicing generosity, um, I hope that you will make being generous toward yourself um, one of your um, one of your commitments for the week, and and to notice it, to notice it. So it's not just I'm I'm going to be nice to myself, but really notice it that when you when an instance when you have practiced generosity toward yourself. And um, I hope we can uh, check in about that next week and, um, and talk about that. These are just such beautiful um, examples that are here. Anything else anyone would like to, does anyone have a, a suggestion of something they're going to do concretely? And it could be something you're doing already, but you're going to do it now with more intentionality about generosity. Oh, Judy, turn into the body with kindness. Uh, Hamza, Sharon Salzberg named her critical voice Lucy from the Peanuts comic strip. Right. Maria is going to recognize feelings, <laughs> allow uh, the rain practice, recognize feelings, allow, investigate, nurture the rain practice. It's a very, very powerful, powerful practice. And very that's from Maria, and then Miriam is, I'll be mindful of forgiving myself and others. That's really, really beautiful. And you know, um, Rick Hansen, who is, uh, he has a new book, Neuro, Neurodharma, but he's written um, Hardwiring Happiness and uh, Resilience, and is a wonderful meditation teacher and um, and scientist, he always says that we are, um, you know, because of our evolutionary past, we are like um, Velcro for the negative. And we are like Teflon toward the positive. So you all know that, you know, if you've ever gotten any sort of a performance review and someone says, you know, here are nine really good things that you're really strong in, and this is the the one area that you can improve in, what you will just focus on is that one area that you can improve on, that we don't take in the good. And there are all sorts of, as I said, evolutionary reasons for being really, having our antennae out for um, the negative, so that we really have to counteract that with the practice of taking in the good. And we really practice that by being very, intentional about recognizing the good and then really appreciating it, really feeling it, um, tasting it. Now, so often in our experience, you know, someone will say, you know, Hamsa, you did a great job. You say, oh yeah, thank you. And that's it. Instead of really appreciating the um, the compliment, really taking something in. And we're, we're taught to sort of brush that off. So when we're really working with our own minds and our own practice, to really take in when we've been able to follow through on something, like showing up tonight, really take that in, the goodness of, of that intention, the goodness of, of following through. And Joe says here, I try to assist with the Buddhist group at Faribault Prison. 
we do not meet as they are on lock on semi lockdown. So every week I submit a letter to the group of 23 men going over something I'm working on, share a quote or a passage, etc. I will do that now with a focus on generosity. Oh, Joe, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for doing that and for, um, for your kindness, for your kindness. I volunteer at another correctional facility and it has been um, really hard that we have no contact at all with the people that we have so regularly been meditating with twice a month and um, no way to contact them. And I just, every morning in my heart, do a, a meta practice for them because that just seems to me um, such a, a difficult, difficult um, situation for, for them to be in. And what our group has done, there are six of us who volunteer, so we can't be with them. And, um, but what we do is the time that we would be with them, we meet together on Zoom and we meditate and we send our our loving good wishes to the men that we can't be sitting with and, and meeting with. And that's been a, a really wonderful way to feel connected with them, even though we cannot connect with them. And there's some more here, Christine, um, Christina, say to myself, I don't have to believe or act on the negative thoughts my mind is producing right now. Oh. Don't have to believe or act on the negative thoughts. And Li Tao says, accepting imperfections in life, including self, others, and all situations. Um, the wonderful teacher, uh, Ruth King, um, who's done such a, has that amazing book, Mindful of Race. She says, life is um, impermanent, impersonal, and imperfect. Always, those are the three characteristics, impermanent, impersonal, imperfect. It's always gonna be that way. Okay. Well, let's just sit together for a few minutes and take in the goodness of our being together. And actually you can before you said, just open up and look around and see who's here. Take in everyone's face. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. And Alexandra, I can't see you, but thank you. Oh, there you are. Thank you, Alexandra. All of you, everyone, beautiful faces. So if you are able next week to come and participate in this, um, I would love to have you. I'd love to hear how some of these efforts work out and um, be here as often as you can, as often as it makes sense in your life. And please feel free to give me feedback and ways that it could be more helpful to you. Um, but I really appreciate um, your practice. And I'll just... Um, just say a little blessing. May we all be safe and protected. May we all be free from inner and outer harm. May we all find strength May we all find peace. May each and every one of us accept ourselves completely and with great kindness, just as we are right now.